Um, good morning. I'm Kotz. I'm one of the pastors here, and we are in part three, I believe, of this series. This series is going to conclude our journey through the book of Acts. So, uh, and you're like, hey, there, we still have a... Uh, eight chapters left, seven chapters left. Yeah, we're going to go through, like, today we're going to go through about two chapters, so we're going to go super light speed, and uh, we're, it's a series called From the Inside, because this is the part in the story of Acts where Paul goes, he dives deep into evil, like, everything that we saw that was going against the movement of God, Paul goes right into the center of it, because he thinks the best way to spread good is not to separate yourself from evil, but to dive deep in there, and from the inside, change the world. So, uh, you'll, you'll start seeing more of those themes in the coming weeks, but today, uh, we are be, we are going to be looking at Acts chapter 21, verse 27, all the way to chapter 23, verse 10. So, we have a lot to cover today, we have about 80 plus slides to get through, but it's okay, I had coffee today, that means I'm going to go through it even faster. So, yes, and everyone's like, all right, we're ready for this. I'm going to talk fast, which means you guys have to listen faster than that. Okay, so today I believe the passage that we're looking at is going to be addressing this question, which is, what does it look like when religion is at its worst? And for some of you, you're like, I've already seen it at its worst, and that's probably the reason why I really struggle to come here this morning, right? Or you might be thinking, I've seen it on TV, you know, and uh, this is the reason why I can't convince my friends to come to church with me, right? Like, we've seen the ugliness of, of religion, and we're not just talking about Christianity, but we've looked, at, you know, we, we tend to see the ugliness of religion no matter where we go. Um, going all the way back to 9-11, people would say, oh, you know, the Muslim terrorists, right? But it's not fair, I, I, at least I don't think it's fair to judge a group of people by its worst actions because the Christians, we've done some pretty bad things and you don't want us to be treat, you know, judged based on whatever bad thing our ancestors have done in the name of Jesus, right? So the question that we'll be looking at is, what causes a religion to turn bad? What causes a religion, a peaceful religion, to turn violent? Because we're going to see that happen today uh, in today's story. And so we're going to start real quick um, from Acts chapter 21. And if you remember last week, this is the part where Paul, he's trying to follow all the Jewish customs, even though he feels like he doesn't need to do it anymore. He does it anyways because he respects the Jews. When he walks into Jerusalem, the epicenter of Judaism, he walks into the temple, he's not going to go in there disrespectfully. He's going to go in there and show love care, kindness. He's going to follow their customs. He's going to follow the rules, the commandments, even though he's convinced that not everybody needs to follow them anymore. But he does it anyways because he doesn't want to cause a ruckus. So this is where we start. He says, some Jews from the province of Asia saw Paul at the temple. Okay, so this is a scene. Paul walks into the temple and there's a lot of different types of Jews from all around the world. And some people from Asia, which is Turk, present day Turkey, they see Paul in there. Okay. And by now, Paul already has a reputation. The reputation is that he's been going around the world, gathering people to join this God movement, but the way he's doing it is kind of controversial. The way that he's doing this is basically he's telling people, if you want to join this movement, you don't have to worry about the, the, the commands of the Old Testament. So, next verse. They stirred up the whole crowd and seized them, shouting, fellow Israelites, help us. So you can just imagine, there's these Jews in the temple, they're there to worship God, they see Paul, and they, they grab him, and they're yelling for help. Everybody, we got Paul, everybody come over here, give us a hand, right? Why? Why? What's, what's, what's up with Paul? Next verse. This is the man who teaches everyone everywhere against, and he lists three things, our people, like Paul is teaching about things that goes against our type of people, like Jews. It goes against Jews. Our law, basic, basically our Bible, right? And this place, the temple. Like Paul is doing these three things. He's telling people to hate on Jews. He's telling people that our traditions, our scriptures are no good. And he's desecrating this place, this holy ground that we're on right, in right now. And Paul's like, okay, I understand the first one. I can see how people might misunderstand what I'm trying to do as being disrespectful to the Jews. But guess what, guys? I'm a Jew also. Number two, uh, this whole thing about the law, I get that too. I can see why people might misinterpret what I'm trying to do as me disrespecting the Bible. I get that, okay? But this place, guys, I have not been in this building, this sacred building, the, the, the temple. I have not been in here for 20 years. How did I desecrate this place? The man who caught him, <laughs> He says, well, he has brought Greeks into the temple and defiled this holy place. What? What's going on here? So here's 
a map of the temple to get an idea of what we're talking about. The tallest part of the temple right here is the Holy of Holies. It's the most sacred area of the temple, okay? And everything else is built around it. If you look carefully right here, there's like a little um, open area. This area is exclusive to people who are male and are Jews. If you are female, then you have to wait out here. Now, this courtyard area right here uh, is like a passing area, but if you look out here, this wall around the temple is called the Soreg Wall, S-O-R-E-G, Soreg Wall. And archeologists have found this tablet that was like a big sign that was posted there. This is what it looks like. This is called a Soreg inscription. The Soreg inscription basically says this. Now, if you read Greek, you could look at this and say, I might be able to make out some of the letters here. We'll translate it for you. This is what it says. No stranger is to enter within the balustrade around the temple and enclosure. Whoever is caught will be himself responsible for his ensuing death. Translation, if you are not a Jew, you are not allowed to be in here. You do not belong here, and if you're walking in here, we can kill you for it. Paul the Apostle, in his letter to the church called Ephesians, he refers to this wall as the wall of hostility and that Jesus came to tear down this wall. Okay, so this is, according to Paul, this is the wall that he thinks is everything that's wrong with my religion. That's what he's saying. Like, we have kept certain people out. We let certain people in. We created this us versus them mentality, right? But according to this person who found Paul inside the temple and he's accusing him of, you know, all these bad things, He's like, Paul, this guy, he has defiled our sacred area because he brought in an outsider into this holy place. Did Paul really do that? Well, Luke tells us in parentheses what he actually did. See, these Jews, they had previously seen Trophimus, or Trophimus, the Ephesian in the city with Paul and assumed that Paul had brought him into the temple. They saw this guy named Trophimus, who is not a Jew, hanging out with Paul in the temple, and they thought, you know, he's already... Um, disrespected our people, he's disrespected our laws. That must be, they just assumed, so they're assuming the worst. That must be Paul bringing in somebody from the outside into this holy place. But Paul didn't really do that. But they just assumed that he did. They're assuming the worst, right? So the whole city, next verse, was aroused and the people came running from all directions. Seizing Paul, they dragged him from the temple and immediately the gates were shut. Which, it's not like a small door. It's like those big, huge doors, like they're pushing it and they're closing it. So make sure that, you know, that Paul doesn't escape. And not only that, the people from the outside can't come in, right? And in the following verses, it even says that they were trying to kill Paul. You have to imagine, at this point, Paul's face is bloody. He has bruises, probably, you know, all over his face also. His clothes are soaked in blood. They're trying to kill him, right? And, and you're wondering, like, how can such a peaceful religion like Judaism caused so much violence in the holiest area of, of their temple, right? How, how did they do this? Well, it's because, put simply, at this point in the story, for the Jews, when they look at Paul, they p label Paul as them. You're not one of us, Paul. You're one of them. Why? Well, it's because of false ac allegations. We heard rumors about you, Paul, that you've been hanging out with people who are not like us. We heard stories about you, Paul, that you talk bad about the, our sacred text. And we just saw you hanging out with somebody in the holiest of areas, uh, people who don't belong in here. So we're making these allegations against you. And because of these allegations, you don't belong here. You're not us, you are them. So Paul is not one of the, uh, the us anymore in this story. Okay, let's keep going. Well, they were trying to kill him News reached the commander of the Roman troops that the whole city of Jerusalem was in an uproar. So even though this is a sacred area for Jews, um, the Romans were occupying the land and they, their job is to maintain peace, right? Because Caesar doesn't want to hear about some small area on the other side of the Mediterranean Sea where there's a big rebellion. So these guys, their job was to make sure that everybody stayed calm, that no, there's no rebellions, there's no uprising. We want to maintain peace in this land. And now they hear that there's a riot happening in their temple, right? So they're like, okay, we gotta do something about this. So he, the, the commander, at once took some officers and soldiers and ran down to the crowd. When the riders saw the commander and his so soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. They're like, okay guys, we gotta stop beating on him. We'll, we'll kill him later because uh, we have some bigger problems now. Keep, let's keep going. 
The commander came up and arrested him and ordered him to be bound with the two chains. A little too much. I mean, by now, Paul is very, very old, so they don't need two chains to stop him. But they do it anyways to show a demonstration that, hey, we are taking this seriously. Then he asked who he was and what he had done. Who are you? Why are you causing this ruckus? Paul wants to say, oh, my name is Paul. You know, he could, he could just answer these questions, right? But he can't because, next verse, some in the crowd shouted one thing and some another, and since the commander could not get at the truth because of the uproar, he ordered that Paul be taken into the barracks. Just take him away. We can't make anything out that he's saying. Like, we can't hear a word he's trying. I'm sure he's a fine guy. I'm not sure, but we can't hear a word he's saying. Let's take him away. They take him to the barracks, which is like their prison. Then... When Paul reached the steps, the violence of the mob was so great, he had to be carried by the soldiers. I mean, this is for one old dude, right? The, crew, the crowd that followed kept shouting, get rid of him, get rid of him. So now the Romans are like, well, okay, whoever this guy is, he must be like one of the worst kinds of human beings in this world because these people here in, in Israel, they're peace-loving people. Like, for them to want to get rid of this man, wanting to kill him, closing the doors, all those things. He must be a huge danger to society. Let's continue. As the soldiers were about to take Paul into the barracks, he asked the commander, may I say something to you? Now, you might be thinking, how how does he do this? Because Paul is a Hebrew. He speaks Hebrew, right? But the soldiers are not Jewish. They are Romans. They don't speak their language. So what is Paul doing here? He's using his education because, look, next verse, the soldiers are asking, do you speak Greek? Are you speaking my language? Like, uh, like, wait, I thought you only spoke one language. you speak? Okay, that's cool. He replied, aren't you the Egyptian who started a revolt and led 4,000 terrorists out of the wilderness some some time ago? Like, you know, with all the, everybody's screaming and starting this revolt, we thought you were that guy that came and started a revolt like a few months ago. Like, I thought you were that Greek guy, that, that Egyptian guy. It's like, no, that's not me. Look, I speak, I speak your language, right? And Paul also said, I am a Jew from Tarsus and Cilicia, which is a nice city, by the way. Like, a lot of the educated people come from there. A city of no ordinary city. A citizen of no ordinary city. Please let me speak to the people. And so these Roman soldiers are like, wait a minute. You're educated. You're speaking my language. So here's the interesting thing, okay? So for the Jews... Paul was labeled as them, not us, but them, because the allegations, right? But to the Romans, Paul was labeled as us. Why? Well, because of familiar language. Oh, did you just speak my language? Oh, yeah, you're, you're one of us. You're a bro. You're one of us. You know, like, hey, speak secret handshake, right? This is, right? And then Paul's like, may I speak to this, these people? And he's like, well, of course, the floor is yours. So Paul stands up. And he's like, okay, I have something to say to my fellow people. Next verse. After receiving the commander's permission, Paul stood on the steps and motioned to the crowd. Let's see what he says. When they were all silent, he said to them in Aramaic, which is a dialect of Hebrew that the common people back then spoke, the Jews spoke. Brothers and fathers, listen now to my defense. So now he's speaking the crowd's language. Right? And when they heard him speak to them in Aramaic, they became very quiet. Now they're like, wait a minute, Paul is speaking our dialect. Well, maybe he's one of us now. Let's continue. Then Paul said, I'm a Jew, born in Tarsus of Cilicia, but brought up in this city. It's like, whoa, you are one of us. Right? I mean, you grew up in Jerusalem. You were born over there, but you're, you're right? Well, how's your education? Well, I studied under Gamaliel. Gamaliel is one of the highest rabbis of the day, right? If you, were, if you learned under Gamaliel, you're like, oh yeah, you're like Harvard or UCLA, really high level, right? <laughs> and was thoroughly trained in the law of our ancestors. Your accusation is that Paul has been disrespecting, disregarding the Old Testament. And Paul's like, no, 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 I studied under Gamaliel. And not only that, my PhD was in Old Testament literature. Trust me, I know, I probably studied this stuff more than you did, crowd, right? And then he says, I was just, uh, I was just as zealous for God as any of you are today. I understand why you guys are trying to kill me because I was there. If I knew that there was somebody in this town that was disrespecting this temple or disrespecting my text or my people, I would be doing the same thing. I was just as zealous as you are today. 
right? This is what Paul is saying. I know you because I used to be you, right? And did what you are doing right now. I used to kill Christians. I used to put them in jail. I used to travel afar just to get rid of women and children who were of the way, which is code for Christianity, right? And not only that, that's not where I stop, right? I also have already been where you are going. Like right now, you're trying to kill me. Been there, done that. But guess what? I've done even for like the trajectory your life is going. I've been beyond where you are right now. This is where you're headed. He continues. I persecuted the followers of this way, the Christians, to their death, arresting both men and women and throwing them into prison as the high priest and all the council can themselves testify. If you don't believe me, just talk to any of your heroes in this city and they'll say, oh yeah, about 20 years ago, yeah, we sent Paul to kill these people. So like they could testify. They, like I have, you know, I have witnesses here that I used to be just like you. And then he says, but that's not all, folks. I did more than what you are doing right now. I even obtained letters, which you guys haven't done yet, but I have. I obtained letters from them to their associates in Damascus and went there to bring these people as prisoners to Jerusalem to be punished. I even got a permission slip from the greatest people of the city to go and kill these people, to throw them into prison, to persecute them. Have you guys done that? Uh, no. Well, I have. It's like, whoa, you are like way beyond where we are, Paul. By the way, why do you go by Paul? That's a Gentile name. Go back to your old name, Saul. I think we like that better, right? And then he goes on and tells his story. He says, oh, and by the way, there's this Christian by the name of Stephen. Yep, yeah, killed him too. You know, I was like, whoa, really? You did? You're like, yeah. And then uh, I was uh, on this road uh, to a place called Damascus, and all of a sudden there was this bright light that shined. I fell off my horse. The men who were with me also saw the bright light, although I feel like I was the only one that was hearing the voice that was coming from the light. And uh, as I was listening, I felt like I was having an encounter with God, and God told me to go to this other place where, you know, because I lost my sight, I was able to see again at that point, you know, right? And so Paul's telling his story. And as he's telling this story, all of a sudden he realizes that the crowd in front of him, well, Paul, at this point, by the people who called them, you know, earlier said, you are them, not us. Well, now he's labeled as us. Why? Well, because of similar experiences. Oh, you speak Aramaic, you're one of us. Oh, you try to kill any Christians, you're like one of us, right? Are you guys catching on to this thing about us versus them? All of a sudden, people are saying, you're one of us because you speak our language. You're one of us because you have a similar experience. You're not part of us because you don't like the things that we're doing, right? They're drawing these lines based off of, well, everybody has their own story. You're not one of us because you don't speak our language. You're not one of us because you don't look like us. You are one of us because you root for the same team as we do, right? We have these us versus them lines that we draw all over the place, right? And then at the end of the speech, Paul has this finishing line of his story. This is how that part goes. Then, as a part of his story, the Lord said to me, and he's telling the people in front of him, go, I will send you far away to the Gentiles. To which the crowd said, See, the crowd listened to Paul until he said this. Then they raised their voices and shouted, rid the earth of him. He's not fit to live. Okay, so remember, for the Jews, he was, not, he was part of the them. Now he's part of us. And now he's back to them. Why this time? This time, different reason. Because of who he decided to include into this movement of God. It's like you have a chalk and you're drawing. Nope, you're on the other side of the line. You're them. Oh, oh, you still, let me erase that. You're part of us. Oh, oh, so you want to include other people. Okay, no, we're drawing the line again. There's this back and forth, back and forth going on. And you'll notice that the Romans are doing the same thing. Let's continue. As they were shouting and throwing off their cloak and flinging dust into the air, the commander ordered that Paul be taken into the barracks. Like, oh, we thought the, the riot was, you know, has calmed down. Nope, it's starting up again. Uh-oh, let's take him away. Then he directed that he be flogged and interrogated in order to find out why the people were shouting at him like this. So they're like, wait a minute, we still don't know why people want to kill Paul. Like, from, we heard what you just said, and it doesn't sound like it was bad. Like, what, what did he do wrong, right? But the thing that the Romans know here at this point is that these people want to kill him, and they're willing to start a riot for that very reason. So all of a sudden, the Romans are like, well, we don't know what he did wrong, but... We are going to lay you on the floor and we're going to flog you. We're going to beat you to death. So all of a sudden the Romans, 
before they were like, you're one of us because you spoke our language. Now Paul again is labeled as them. Why? Well, it's because of public opinion. <laughs> we don't know what you did wrong, Paul, but everybody here wants you dead and we want to make sure that we're pleasing them so we will do everything we can to follow what they want us to do. So they're about to flog Paul. So you're one of them again. Back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And there's more of that coming. The commander went to Paul and asked, tell me, are you a Roman citizen? Why, yes. Yes, I am, Paul, he ans- Paul answered. And then he said, as they stretched him out to flog him, Paul said to the centurion standing there, hey, just wondering, is it legal for you to flog a Roman citizen who hasn't even been found guilty? Like, hey, you know I'm a Roman citizen, right? Are you allowed to do this to me? Because I'm pretty sure the last time I checked, if you're a citizen of the Roman Empire, you're not allowed to be tortured this way. So then the commander said, I had to pay a lot of money for my citizenship. So this is his, the Roman soldier's way of measuring himself up to Paul. It's like, oh, so you're a Roman citizen. You know, I paid a lot of money to become a Roman citizen. I was not born into the Roman Empire. I had to pay and go through this whole process to become a Roman citizen, right? Paul's answer, <clears throat> but I was born a citizen. I'm a natural citizen. I didn't have to pay to become a citizen, right? So basically he's saying, Hey, I paid a lot of money to be a Roman citizen. Paul's like, well, I didn't need to do that because I'm better. I was naturally a Roman citizen. Okay, so at this point, the centurions can't do anything to Paul because Paul is now labeled as us by the Roman Empire because of his citizenship and rank. Now, you're like, well, there's a lot going on in this story. Like, I don't know if I could keep up. So. Here's a quick summary of what's been going on. So this dude right here, without face, his name is Paul, okay? This is Paul. And then he shows up to the temple and a bunch of Jews see him. So here's Mr. Jewish person. And he says, there's a wall here because you're on the other side of the wall. You are one of them. And the big riot starts. So the Roman uh, commander shows up and says, whoa, 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 calm down, calm down. Let me deal with this. Next slide. So... The Roman citizen is like, wait a minute, so you are a rebellious person because I see that there's a riot that's happening, so you're one of them, wall in between, right? And then he says, oh, I speak your language. Like, oh, okay, let's tear on the wall, you're one of us. And then Paul's like, I wanna share, I wanna say something to my people in this temple, may I? He's like, sure, the floor is yours. And he starts sharing this story to the, the, the fellow Jews, and he starts speaking Aramaic and he starts talking about how he used to persecute Christians just like them. And they're like, yes, you're one of us. Yes, thank you. Until the very last line of that speech when he says, oh, and God called me to reach out to the Jews. And they're like, no, wall back up, right? <laughs> and then he's like, you're, you're, you know, yeah, Paul, you're one of them. And then a big riot starts up again. And because the riot starts, next slide, the Roman centurion, shows, uh, the commander shows up and says, wait, calm down, calm down. Uh, because everybody wants to kill you, you are one of them. So next slide. So you know, another wall comes up, and then he's like, but I'm a Roman citizen. It's like, oh, Roman citizen, let's take down that wall. You're one of us. It's supposed, like the way that Luke writes this in the book of Acts, it's supposed to make you get dizzy a little bit because people's allegiances are changing all the time. And it's not for like some deep reason. It's for very shallow, superficial reasons. Now, we're moving through the story quickly, so this is what happens. The Roman uh, soldier is like, well, we're not going to flog you anymore. We're not going to do anything bad to you because you're one of us. But we still have to figure out why people want you dead. So this is what we're going to do. Tomorrow morning, I'm going to convene a meeting with you. It's like a trial. With you explaining yourself to this group of people called the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin. Next slide. Sanhedrin are basically made up of three groups of people. The high priest, who's like the in charge of this whole thing. And we have the Pharisees, and we have the Sadducees, and together there's 70 of them, okay? And in the Sanhedrin, they basically are the elite group of Jerusalem. If you want anything uh, to be like dealt with, you talk to the Sanhedrin. If you wanna know if somebody's guilty and why they're guilty, you talk to the Sanhedrin, because these guys make the final decision. Think of it like the Supreme Court, okay? Okay, so the next morning, Paul shows up and he says, guys, Uh, let me explain to you what's going on. You'll find out right away that I'm actually innocent. But the minute he shows up, there's this wall of hostility again. Why? Well, it's really hard to explain why, but look at how Luke describes it. Paul looked straight at the Sanhedrin and said, my brothers, I have fulfilled my duty to God in all good conscience to this day. Translation, 
I didn't do anything wrong. You know I didn't do anything wrong, and God knows I didn't do anything wrong. So I, I think you know, he had a pretty good argument because they can't really pinpoint exactly what he did wrong, right? Their response? At this, the high priest Ananias ordered those standing near Paul to strike him on the mouth. Like he, they're like, no reason at all. We're just going to slap you in the mouth. So immediately, Paul is labeled as them. Why? Because about 20 years ago, there was a guy named Jesus who stood in front of the Sanhedrin, and he caused a ruckus also, right? So now they're like, I don't want to hear your story. All we know is that you're guilty, right? Because of who you follow, Paul. You follow Jesus, and we know where this is going. It's been 20 years since he's been there. He's like, I, I don't, like, what did I, really, what did I do wrong except follow a rabbi that resurrected from the dead? Like, what's wrong? Like, what did I do wrong, right? So Paul at this point realizes, There's nothing I could do to change these people's minds. What should I do? And at that point, he realized, wait a minute. He starts to notice the thing that we're noticing in this story. He notices that people are changing allegiances for very shallow reasons, right? So he says, I could use this to my advantage. So this is what he does. Then Paul, knowing that some of them were Sadducees and the others were Pharisees, called out in the Sanhedrin, and he's like, this is, I want to say one thing to you guys. To you, Sanhedrin, my brothers, I am a Pharisee, descended from Pharisees. Like, my dad was a Pharisee, I'm a Pharisee, taught under Gamaliel, and I, you know, got my degree in Old Testament text, right? And maybe my grandfather was a, was a Pharisee. Like, we are, a, like, I come from a line of highly religious people, so respect to me, right? I stand on this trial because of the hope of the resurrection of the dead. It's like, and I believe that Jesus rose from the dead. And I know, and he looks at the Pharisees, you guys agree with me because you guys believe in an afterlife. Now, the key word here is resurrection. This is, the mat- this is a trigger word. This is the word that really separates the Pharisees from the Sadducees. Quick background on Sadducees. Sadducees only believe in the first five books of the Old Testament, the Torah, right? Genesis to Deuteronomy. And if you only look at those five books of the Old Testament, there's very little mention of what happens after you die. And for that reason, they believe that after you die, you turn to dirt and that's the end of your story. Whereas the people who read the entire Old Testament would say, oh no, no, there's something that happens to you after you die, right? So there is a resurrection. And so these people in the Sanhedrin, they were all getting along because of their common hatred for Paul and the movement of Jesus. All of a sudden, they turn against each other because Paul said the trigger word, which is resurrection. So when he said this, a dispute broke out between the Pharisees and the Sadducees within the Sanhedrin, and the assembly was divided. So Paul's like, he's basically like dropping a bomb in there and just kind of standing back and watching the whole thing unravel. Let's go on. There was a great uproar, and some of the teachers of the law who were Pharisees stood up and argued vigorously. So this is getting bigger and bigger. And then he says this. We find, and this is really interesting, we find nothing wrong with this man. He's pointing at Paul. Like, you know what? As a matter of fact, I don't see anything wrong that Paul has done. They said, what if a spirit or an angel has spoken to him? Right? And then the dispute became so violent that the commander was afraid Paul would be torn into pieces by them. Like, they're all pulling apart of Paul and saying, like, no, he's innocent. He's guilty, right? He ordered the troops to go down and take him away from them by force and bring him into the barracks. So what just happened? This is what happened. So we have Paul, who's standing in trial against... um, the, San- the Sanhedrin, right? And obviously, from the very beginning, you've realized this is an unfair tri- trial that he is being labeled as them already. So, Paul's thinking, like, what am I supposed to do in this situation? How do I get out of this? Now, something interesting happens in the text. Although the Sanhedrin is composed of the high priest, the Pharisees, and the Sadducees, from this point on this story, next slide, um, he's not in the story anymore. The, the high priest isn't in the story anymore. It, it's just the, the Sanhedrin and the, and the Pharisees. And so Paul decides to say the magic word. He says, resurrection. And all of a sudden, next slide, there's a division right here. So it's like us versus them versus them, right? And then halfway through this big argument, the Pharisee says, you know what? No, actually, I'm on this side now. So it's like Paul and Pharisee versus the Sadducees. So quick summary of what just happened. The us within the Sanhedrin became them, 
and Paul was labeled as us by the Pharisees. Confusing? It's supposed to be, okay? Why did this happen? It's all because of doctrines. It's because they, one group believes in something called the resurrection, the other side doesn't, and because of that, they create a wall between them. On the other hand, Paul believes in the resurrection, and so do the Pharisees, so they took out that wall, and now they're together. Paul makes a great discovery at this point in the story, and he used it to set this whole thing off, right? Paul was able to see the shallowness of religion. He realized that people would say, oh, you're us, you're them, based on these artificial lines that could be drawn with chalk and then erased later. And, it's, and the reason he was able to see the shallowness is because he was exposed to the depths of the all-inclusive love of Jesus. Think about it this way. When you start following Jesus, there is no, at least there isn't supposed to be, an us versus them. If you're a Christian, I will love you unconditionally. If you're not a Christian, I will love you unconditionally. If you look like me, I will love you unconditionally. If you don't look like me, I will love you unconditionally. If you speak my language, I will love you. If you don't speak my language, I will love you anyways. These people have committed themselves to loving everybody regardless of how different they are from us. You don't believe in the same doctrines that I believe in, I'll love you anyways. You believe and agree with everything I say, I'll still love you too. Like, no matter what it is, I will love you no matter what. And when you live your life like that, and then you enter into a system where there's a bunch of us versus them, and people are drawing and erasing lines all over the place, all of a sudden you start to see how shallow this is. So Paul is walking into this setting. He experienced the all-inclusive love of Jesus, and now he's entering into the system where there's a bunch of lines drawn and erased all the time. And he realizes this is so shallow. And he sees it. The people who are part of it, which Paul used to be a part of it, right? The people who are part of the system, they don't see it because to them, these lines are everything for them. It's their identity markers. I know who I am because I know who I'm against. But Paul walks into this setting and realizes, no, my identity is firmly rooted in Christ who loves all people. And when he walks into these, this religious system, he realizes, I can't believe I used to be part of this. He sees it clearly because, and nobody else can see it clearly because Paul is outside of the system now. So in other words, religion is at its worst. Religion at its worst is gathering based on us versus them. This is the worst that could happen. From this, violence could come about. From this, accusations could come about. Isolation could come about. But let's be honest. Because, you know, like, why is my pastor coming up here and telling me that religion is really bad, right? Well, I'm not saying that. Like, I'm not trying to convince you to never come to church again, right? Why is my pastor saying that? Because if you think outside of religion, what you'll discover is this, that humanity is at its worst, right, when these gatherings are based off of us versus them. We see this happen all the time. Today is Super Bowl Sunday. I'm sure there's a bunch of, you're a Chiefs fan or you're an Eagles fan? My wife told me who was playing. I had no idea who was playing in the Super Bowl. She was like, remember Cots, Chiefs and Eagles. Okay, right? Or the fact that I didn't know who was playing today, you're like, oh, you're one of them, Cots. <laughs> or some of you are like, yeah, Cots, we only, you know, like, you're one of us, right? Think politically. Remember, this is not just the church thing. This is not just a religious thing. There is the right versus left. There's us and there's them. Or think economically, socially. Think about there's the rich versus the poor, the middle class. Oh, you're one of us. You're not one of us. You're one of them, right? Or think in terms of internationally. There's the Russians versus the U.S., us versus them. Or if you think back to the pandemic, there's, there's the people who believe in the vaccine and people who don't, us versus them. And it's such a shame that the church had to take a side, you know? Wear a mask, don't wear a mask. Are you, you know, all lives matter or black lives matter? Are you, um, uh, you know, like, what, think of any movement that you've heard in the There's so many of them, right? Four guns against guns. <laughs> Common sense laws, abortion, no abortion. Like, us versus them. It's not just a religious issue, it's a humanity issue. And these lines, when people draw them, 
if you've been following Jesus and you've committed yourself to loving all people regardless of their stances, you look at the people arguing, you look at the politicians arguing, you're looking at the doctors arguing amongst themselves, you look at all these things and you're realizing these lines are so shallow. And you're able to see it because you've committed yourself into loving all people regardless of where they come from, what color skin they have, what they like and hate. Regardless of all that, you have made a commitment to love all people. And for that reason, you, it's so clear to you that these lines, it's not just a religious issue, it's a humanity issue. And we will continue to draw these lines. And you're gonna think, I can't believe they drew another line. Gen Z versus Gen X, TikTokers versus YouTubers, right? Let's draw another line there, let's draw a line there. Oh, let's erase it because those guys aren't so bad, you know, right? As Christians, we are called to love all people. And by the way, people draw lines inside the church too, right? (laughs) Right, there's people who are like, Calvinists and there's Armenians and there's people who believe in dispensationalism, people who are post-millennial, pre-millennial. Some of you guys don't even know what those words mean, but trust me, there are lines there, you know? Denominational lines. But we are called to love everybody unconditionally because that's the way of Jesus. Amen? All right, let's pray.